Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon to everybody here on the East Coast, and good morning still to everyone in other parts of the country. Uh, thanks for taking some time out of your day today to join us to talk about TrimTech 101, how to dose mix and apply. Uh, we had a webinar last week um, where we had a real life case study from a TrimTech user, uh, Sean Fitzgerald from Phoenix Landscape in South Carolina. Um, if you wanna know more about how TrimTech can work in your business, I'd strongly encourage you to watch that recording. Um, you can find that on our website, treecarescience.com, as well as our YouTube page. So this is kind of a follow up to that. Um, again, we are living in some unprecedented times here with everything going on. So we just, again, with that context in mind, uh, want to let you guys know that, you know, Rainbow Scientific is still here uh, to serve you in, in every capacity that we can. Um, we are still um, shipping products, creating products, providing training. Um, so we're still here. So please still free, feel free to reach out to us for any comments, questions um, in the coming weeks as we continue on through this uh, unprecedented time. Just to let you, everybody know here as well, we have some other webinars coming up. Um, so we were able to get a webinar series put together fairly quickly. This is an example of some of the other webinars we have coming up here, things around Emerald Ash Borer. We have some, um, some webinars that are regionally specific for California. We have some webinars that are um, based around training as well. So for your technicians in the field, um, one that's coming up with one of our own, Chris Haugen, on uh, plant healthcare basic technical training for proper mixing of pesticides and spray techniques. So something that would be good for technicians to review. Uh, and then next week, um, we're gonna be doing a webinar on specific insect scale management in commercial landscapes. So we're gonna talk about some common scale insects that affect commercial landscapes, how you could treat for them, um, and how they could be used as a, an additional enhancement service uh, for some of the landscape management companies out there managing those commercial landscapes and looking for new opportunities uh, for enhancements and to help trees and shrubs look better on, on client sites. So tune into that one uh, next week. If you guys have any, and gals, have any other ideas or questions, um, topics that you would like webinars on or for us to reach out to you on, please feel free to email us at info.treecarescience.com or talk to your local territory manager or arborologist. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started today. One is, of course, we always like to start off with a safety assessment. Um, you know, many of us here are operating in, in different circumstances, maybe working from home or, um, you know, different spots of the office or, you know, out remotely someplace. So make sure that you're in a safe place and take note of any cords or anything that could be a tripping hazard. Um, Throughout the um, broadcast today, if you have any questions or a conversation today, if you have any questions, uh, you can expand your go-to meeting bar. So there's this little arrow. If you click on that, this will expand out this whole window here. If you have any questions at any time, just type those questions into that question box. And at the conclusion of the slide presentation, we'll get to questions. Um, Matt Karst with Rainbow. Uh, is with us here today as our co-host, so he'll be able to uh, view those questions and, and read them off at the end of the uh, broadcast today. Um, and again, this webinar is being recorded, and so a video link will be sent out uh, at the conclusion of this, uh, as well as eventually we'll make its way onto our website and to our YouTube page. Um, and for CEUs, this webinar will be uh, worth one ISA CEU, so that's International Society of Arbor Culture Certified Arbor CEU. Um, for this though, you're gonna have to do self-reporting um, because we put these webinars together fairly quickly. Uh, we didn't have time to go through the usual channels of getting everything approved with the ISA, um, but you should have no problem doing um, self-reporting if you have that designation uh, certified arborist um, and you'll get an email at the conclusion of this webinar as well on how you can self-report to get your one ISA CE. And so me, this me, Patrick Anderson, I'm an arborologist here with Rainbow Scientific. Um, I live outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and so I'll be uh, your presenter today. So there's a, there's a picture of me if you've never seen me in real life. So with that, let's get started. Uh, again, so TrimTech 101, how to dose, mix, and apply. Also, what I like to call the hows, what's, whys of TrimTech. 
All right. And just a quick background on Rainbow 2. So we are a company that is based in research. So when we bring a protocol or a product to market, know that it is backed in replicated trial research. Uh, we do both our internal trials as well as partner with a host of research institutions and private companies. Uh, so this is an example of just some of the companies and institutions that we've partnered with. And just an example of the type of research we do, we did over 150 field trials last year in 2019 alone. Um, we also provide in-field training as well as virtual training. Um, so if you have any questions on um, shrub and tree care products or protocols or equipment or products, feel, please feel free to reach out to us. And of course, we provide a whole host of tech support. Um, we have a lot of industry knowledge, a lot of institutional knowledge on tree and shrub care top topics. So you can reach out to our tech support line, um, you can email us, you can call us, you can even text, text us, um, and we'll get back to you with, um, again, a, a, an answer and, and hopefully be able to help you out. Uh, we provide a lot of other resources as well, as well as diagnostic guides, opportunity guides, application guides, all kinds of things uh, to help you out. And of course, we have a whole host of products outside of just TrimTech. Uh, whether they be plant growth regulators, insecticides for tree and shrub care problems, fungicides, uh, as well as nutrients and things like that. So, um, and just real quick before we really get into it here, just a, a look at our company values. So we align to a set of eight company values. And the ones that I always like to call it before we do a presentation is one that top one, science-based. So everything we talked about today is based in replicated research. And that third one down, honesty and integrity, um, we're here, uh, again, we're, we're going to tell you what's what and what's so. So our intended outcomes for this afternoon slash this morning is we're going to understand the science of how plant growth regulators achieve growth regulation. We're going to understand the secondary health benefits of plant growth regulators. And then we're going to get into the application methods and timing for TrimTech. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about why sometimes TrimTech applications fail to help make sure that you, everybody is up to date on these. So in case you are not familiar with plant growth regulators, they sound scary to you. Plant growth regulators have been around for a very long time. Uh, they were popularized in the floriculture industry. And what the florists realize is that when they spray bedding plants with a plant growth regulator, then they get a plant that doesn't grow as fast, but it looks healthier. Um, it grows more uniform. It has uh, darker, greener leaves and it has a better flower display. So the majority of these annuals and perennials that we're out there planting every year have at some point in time probably come in contact with a plant growth regulator. So if you're not familiar with plant growth regulators, know that, again, in our industry, you probably come in contact with plant growth regulators all the time and, and not even realize it. Uh, so there's nothing spooky here. And again, these have been around for a long time and are, are well proven. So if we look at TrimTech specifically, TrimTech is formulated for ground covered vines, perennials, and shrubs. This is a foliar application. So it's a spray to drip foliar application. And one foliar application should last about 12 weeks, um, plus or minus, depending upon the species, the site, uh, things like that. So the active ingredient in TrimTech is paclobutrazole. And the way this works is it gets absorbed into the subapical meristem. And that subapical apical meristem, so again, this little graph here shows this little bud area. When it gets absorbed into the subapical meristem, it blocks the process that creates a specific plant hormone called gibberellic acid. And so gibberellic acid is responsible for cell elongation and expansion. So if we ask the plant not to produce so much of that gibberellic acid, we get a plant that is still growing, it's still producing the same amount of cells, leaves, what have you, flowers. It's just now those cells aren't getting as large. So I always call this the illusion of growth control because the plant is still growing. It's just not getting as large. So that's how paclobutrazole works. We think of it as called a type two plant growth regulator. Again, blocking that hormone is responsible for cell elongation and expansion. Now, the, the great joke about using pruning as your primary way of reducing growth is the more you prune a plant, the more it responds to that pruning and it responds to that pruning by producing more gibberellin. So in a sense, the more often that you prune a plant, 
especially the harder you prune a plant. So the more foliage you take away from that plant, that plant responds by producing more gibberellin. So your stems, your new growth is growing at a faster rate and it's the cells again are longer. So again, in a sense, by using just pruning to manage tree size or shrub size, you could actually be encouraging it to grow faster than what it would by itself. So that's where plant growth regulators can really, really play a good role. So if we just wanna look at an example of what growth control can look like on certain species from throughout the country, this is ligustrum. Um, this is also called um, Japanese uh, privet or wax leaf ligustrum is what we're looking at here. And so here we can see the difference between an untreated plant and a treated plant 12 weeks after application. Looking at ligustrum here, this is in Oklahoma. This is 10 weeks after treatment. And again, you can see what an untreated plant looks like versus a treated plant. So you can see that we are drastically reducing the amount of internodal growth over a given time period. Here is Laura Petalum. This is a very popularly planted uh, shrub in the southeast part of the United States. Here we can see treatment with another type of plant growth regulator, this in this case a type one plant growth regulator, versus a application with Trimtech. So again, we are drastically reducing above ground top growth with an application of Trimtech. This here, so and we'll get into this later. So Trimtech is only locally systemic. So if you spray one part of the plant and the other part of the plant, the untreated part of the plant will continue to grow. So this is a Burford holly, another super common uh, plant that's planted in commercial landscapes. So here you can see this half of the plant was treated with Trimtect. This half of the plant was left untreated. And you can see the difference in growth control and color, in this case, 14 weeks after treatment. Starting to get the idea that we have very good, reliable results when we use Trimtect to um, apply to a variety of species to reduce growth control. Here we can see Obelia. So on our left and far right here, these plants are left untreated. This in the middle was treated. And you can see the difference in growth over an 18 week period. Uh, getting closer to the end of our uh, examples of growth control, this is Iliagnus. This is uh, many a landscape manager's uh, nightmare or we can see they just grow like crazy constantly. Here we can see untreated Iliagnus versus treated with one foliar application of Trimtech. Pretty astounding results there, that's eight weeks after treatment. Here's boxwood again, you can see the line between the untreated and the treated, this is 18 weeks after treatment. Barberry, which is uh, again in the mid-Atlantic and uh, northern parts of the country, uh, people love printing barberry, right? Everyone loves getting into all those little thorns Again, you can see the difference of 12 weeks after treatment there. So an example here of barberry used as a topiary hedge. You can see this part of the Y was treated with Trimtech and this part of the Y was left untreated. Pretty astounding results. And then finally, rose. Here we can see again the untreated versus the treated. This is 12 weeks after treatment. So all these treated with Trimtech. Um, this can also be used on things like perennial flowers. Uh, this year we have a uh, purple cone flower. You can see the difference between the treated and the untreated there. So what does it all mean for your business? Well, we know we can slow down plant growth regulation, um, but we can also see a labor savings, which can then turn into um, a return investment on safety because we're reducing the need for people to get on ladders, especially in some of these larger plants. We're taking mechanical shears out of people's hands uh, we're reducing waste. Uh, we see that we can reduce waste by as much as um, half um, green waste. Um, in our webinar from last week, Sean Fitzgerald reported that he saw a reduction in at least one third of his green waste when using Trimtech on his sites. We also know that we can reduce labor. And so your reduction in labor is based upon uh, two factors. One is the size of the site and then how vigorously growing those plants are growing. So if you have a site where you have a large site with a lot of vigorous growing plants, we have seen a return on investment in labor by as much as 80%. If you even have, but if you have a smaller site and you have less vigorous growing plants, we see a return on investment often of around 30%. And our largest case study to date this year is in Florida where we looked at five different sites. We averaged out that we saw an average of a 62% reduction in labor over five different sites in Central Florida, which is pretty astounding. Um, that company was very happy with that. 
If we look here too, just from the safety aspect, again, these are Nellie Stevens Hollies. This is at a mall site. These are treated with trim tech. Again, this is reducing the amount of time people have to spend on ladders, which again, just from a safety aspect, these are some of the intangible things we see with trim tech application or plank growth regulator applications, just reducing the amount of time people have to prune, reducing the amount of time our laborers are on ladders, reducing the amount of time that our people have to use um, power tools. And I like this picture here. You can see where we have some escapes on this right here. So in this case here, now this is just two pruning clips with either a pole clip or a pair of loppers versus having to shear this entire plant like we have to do here, shear this entire plant, you know, again, with shears and a ladder. So just reducing the amount of time folks are spending on ladders and using power tools. A little bit more into the science behind how this works and how that can then um, ties into some of these secondary health benefits that we see um, using trim tech. So the first thing that we're doing is we're changing the way the plant is producing hormones. So as we mentioned, we achieve growth control by reducing the amount of gibberellic acid that's produced in the plant. So that's responsible for cell elongation and expansion. As a side effect of that, that actually, some of the elements that go into producing gibberellin also go into producing chlorophyll. So by simply asking the plant not to produce so much gibberellic acid, there are more elements that are free and that they go into producing chlorophyll. And we'll see photographs of that in a moment. The other thing that we see from a hormonal standpoint in the plant is that when we ask the plant to produce less gibberellic acid, in asking it to block that process, we actually increase the amount of abscisic acid. And we think of abscisic acid as a plant protection hormone. So abscisic acid along with auxins play a role in stimulating um, root growth. So that fine root growth, they play a role in closing the stomates in times of drought. So conserving water within the leaves. They also help produce uh, or protect cells from dehydration in general. And abscisic acid also plays a role in stimulating phytodefense compounds to make the plant more disease resistant. So those are some of the physiological changes that happen when we apply trim tech. Some of the morphological changes that happen is when we apply trim tech is that we change the morphology of the leaves. So we actually create a thicker waxy cuticle. So that thicker waxy cuticle helps to reserve water within that leaf. It also makes it more difficult for leaf disease spores to drop their uh, feeding apparatus through that wax cuticle into the cells where they're being causing damage. So this is where we see some of that drought resistance and disease resistance. Likewise, we see an increase in the amount of microscopic trichome hairs. So these trichome hairs, and you can see there's the untreated and the treated, they produce, one is they produce a microclimate around the leaf, basically holding in warm air during the winter to protect from winter desiccation and keep in shading the, the leaf in the summer and reducing the amount of water loss from the leaf. They also can be a direct interference from a leaf disease spore landing on the leaf and causing um, disease. Some examples in real life of using Trimtech to pr produce this secondary health benefit response. Here we can see uh, these are fire blight trials that we looked at here. So this is with um, Bartlett tree experts in Charlotte, North Carolina. And so what we did here was we had trees that were left untreated. We have trees that were treated with the with copper, which is a copper uh, or copper, which is a commonly used protocol for managing fire blight. And then we have trees that were treated with paclobutrazol or what would become the formulation of Trimtect. And so we can see that over a period of time, we have reduced disease instance using Trimtect alone. We could argue that the copper sprays performed better, but this is two sprays of copper versus just one spray with uh, what would become Trimtech. Another example of disease suppression, this is low growth sumac with powdery mildew. And so we can see the difference between the untreated plant and the treated plant there. An example of change in color for the better. So here we can see the untreated portion of this taxis versus the treated portion of this taxis. Recall just a few moments ago, I said that we can increase chlorophyll content in the plant by simply asking the plant not to produce so much gibberellin. 
in a sense, taking some of those elements and putting them into chlorophyll production. So here you can see the difference between the untreated and the treated plant. So this can be a way, if you have chronically yellow shrubs out on a property and they don't seem to be responding to traditional fertilizer regimes, this could also be used as a tool to help with plant appearance. Here we can see on rows the illusion of more flowers. So this is our untreated and our treated. When you look at that six weeks later, you can see our untreated plant, we're starting to see some chlorosis, we're starting to see some black spot. It's growing uh, vigorously. It looks like we have less flowers on it versus our treated plant is denser, greener, and we have the illusion of more flowers because those flower stems, of course, are not just, they're not far away from the plant, they're all compact right there in the plant. So we have the illusion of better flowering. And here too is a good example. This is abelia, this is eight weeks after treatment and you can see the amount of flowers on these abelia. So there's two reasons for this. One is, is we can actually encourage flowering when we use Trimtec. So the plant might actually produce more flowers because it has, again, it's not putting so much energy into that above ground top growth. So it can reinvest that energy into flower production is one reason. The other reason is, if you think about abelium, all those flowers are being produced on new growth. And if we're coming through every few weeks and pruning this plant to maintain size and shape, well, we're pruning off all of those flowers. So by not pruning as often, we're getting a better flower display, and we also might be encouraging flowers because of the way um, the product is influencing uh, plant physiology. We can also see weed suppression in ground covers. And this is a great use of Trimtect um, that will probably become more popular as the years go on. So in this case here, what we have is we have our untreated bed and we can see all of this herbaceous grass material that's growing up through that ground cover there versus our treated bed. And so here you can see not only is the, the ground cover regulated, in this case here, this is Asiatic Jasmine, not only do we have regulation of our ground cover, but if we were to pull back the canopy of this ground cover, we would find that we had weeds growing there, yes, but those weeds were in a sense over-regulated. So they never grew to the point of breaking through the canopy of the, the ground cover. So if you can treat your ground covers early in the spring before those weeds begin to break through, you can actually reduce the amount of weeds that are going into um, those beds and improve appearance. So now moving on to the actual application. So that's a good indication of what your expectations could be for growth control, um, how the, the product actually works within the plant, um, and then some of those neat secondary benefits of using Trimtech to improve plant quality and appearance and color and things like that. Um, but now really, this is where the magic happens, is the actual application process. So with Trimtech, again, Basically, from a high level, we are mixing the product into water and we are spraying it on the plant. It sounds pretty simple and it's things that you and your technicians are probably doing every day. But there are some caveats, some nuance to the mixing and application process uh, that are really important to, to think about and to follow to make sure you're getting all these great results that we just saw and we know you can get. So it begins with the equipment you're using in the first place. So we highly, highly, highly recommend, almost insist on the fact that you use some kind of motorized power spray equipment. So whether that be something like this motorized backpack, like we offer the Mariyama uh, MS-75 um, with a motor on it, or if you're using more traditional spray equipment like a skid mounted sprayer or a spray truck with an engine, you know, again, that has a higher capacity we highly recommend that you can use some type of motorized application equipment. This is to ensure good coverage as well as penetration into the plant. And again, just through years of trial and error and case studies, we have found that you get better results when using some kind of powered piece of equipment. To that, we recommend, highly recommend the use of something like a JD9 spray gun. There's a lot of different kind of models of this, but you know, you're probably all familiar with something that looks like this illustration here. So a JD9 spray gun or equivalent. Um, when spraying, we recommend that you spray, adjust your nozzle to a spray at a 30 to 40 to 5 spray angle. And that is to ensure, again, full coverage of the plant, to encourage that we're getting 
again, nice coverage on our intended area. If it's that spray angle is too wide, we get drift, uh, and again, essentially wasting product. If it's too narrow, we, we're not gonna affect enough of the plant and we're gonna be spraying directly into the plant and not spraying on top of the plant where we want it to be. The other distinction here is that we wanna set our um, pounds per square inch, our setting at our pump fairly low. So we wanna have our PSI at the pump between 50 and 80 PSI. Most folks, if they're to look at their spray equipment, they're probably spraying anywhere between 150 to maybe 250 PSI, which is great for a lot of applications. But with TrimTech, because we wanna make sure that we are spraying the drip and we're coating the plant, a big part of TrimTech is we want nice big water droplets that will hit the leaf surface and then go down onto the stem where the, where the product will be absorbed and go ahead uh, and start blocking that dibber on production. So on your spray equipment, you wanna make sure that at the pump it's set between 50 and 80 PSI. And all tanks are a little different and things like that. So you wanna make sure uh, you know, that it's gonna, it's gonna be adjusted correctly for the equipment that you're using. Um, the other part of this too is we wanna make sure that we are keeping agitation the entire time. So if you're using a backpack, you know, it's gonna be easy, we can just shake that backpack. But if we're mixing into a larger container, like a 50 to you know 500 gallon um, water container for spraying, we wanna make sure that that container has agitation in it. Uh, example, jet agitation will be fine. Um, you know, paddle agitation, they'll be better, but jet agitation will work just fine. But make sure that agitation is functioning and that's running as you are mixing. So, for foliar application, again, we want to have a five to seven gallon per minute tip in our JD9 or equivalent. We want to make sure that our fan angle is at 30 to 45 degrees. We want to make sure our pump is set to 50 to 80 PSI. And when we spray, we want to have a consistent overlapping application pattern. So I always uh, equate it to like you're painting some shutters with spray paint. You want to have a nice, overlapping consistent pattern to make sure you're getting even distribution over the entire plant. The other distinction here with TrimTech is that we wanna make sure we're adding some type of non-ionic surfactant to the solution. So this creates uniformity in the distribution. What it does is it helps it break up the surface tension of that water droplet. So when we're spraying the plant, we don't want those solution droplets to be bouncing off the plant and going other places. We want it so that when that solution hits the leaf, it starts to spread and moves down the stem. So here's a quick video. This is from Exacto. They produce Audible 90. That's a non surfactant that uh, Rainbow we pr provide. And so you'll see here, this is a droplet of water with, uh, again, you can see there's a dye in there so you can see very easily. So a droplet of water with a dye, but no surfactant. And then notice that off camera, someone's gonna come in with a droplet with uh, water and dye and audible 90. So you can see how this is barely moving, whereas our surfactant treated water is moving very, very readily and see how it's starting to go down to where we want it to go. So this is super important. So when we talk about you know applications that aren't successful and we start breaking down, okay, did we mix correctly? Did we use the right pressure? We're using the right equipment. Did you use a spreader sticker? This is where we often find breakdown. So when mixing trim tech, you need to use some kind of non-ionic surfactant. I'm happy with whatever non-ionic surfactant you're using currently. We carry Audible 90 um, and it works very, very well. So now the next part of this is gonna be the actual mixing of the product. So you will notice that with Trimtech, Trimtech is, um, it can fall out of solution in the bottle. So one, you wanna make sure you shake your Trimtech bottle vigorously. The next part is then to decide what rate you're gonna use. So different plant species in different rate regions of the country have a different recommended rate. So decide upon what is the best rate for your part of the country and the species you're gonna to apply to. Then you're gonna to wanna to mix your surfactant. So again, 
we recommend two mils per gallon of Audible 90. That equates to about six ounces per 100 gallon. And your water. Now, Audible 90, we sell in this neat little pump. So it comes in this uh, packaging here with a pump on it. And each pump would deliver two mils, which would be, again, just what you would need for one gallon of solution. So we have our Trimtec bottle. We have shaken it up. We've decided what our rate is going to be. Now we need to concentrate on actually putting it into water, putting it into solution. So this follows the procedure of what the best management practice is for mixing any product, but it is very crucial that we follow this when we talk about mixing Trimtec. So it begins with one, we want to fill up our container to approximately half of the amount of total desired solution. So again, you know, showing our Mariama backpack, or in this case here, a larger spray equipment. That's where we would add in our half of our total desired amount of solution. Then we would put in our trim tech. Now this is a key distinction here. So we'll use an example here. Let's say that we want to mix it 10 ounces of trim tech per gallon of solution. The key here is we're talking about mixing 10 ounces of trim tech so that we have a total solution of one gallon or 128 ounces. So that means adding 10 ounces of Trimtec to 118 ounces of water to get a total final solution of 128 ounces. What a lot of folks will do is they'll show up on site with their tank filled already. So in this example, someone might show up on site with their tank and it already has a gallon of solution in it. And then they add their 10 ounces of Trimtec now we don't have a gallon of solution, we have a little bit more because now instead of having 128 ounces of total solution, we actually have 138 ounces. So the dose that we're applying to our plant has been reduced a little bit because it's not a true gallon solution, it's a little bit more than a gallon solution. If you have any questions on that, um, please feel free to um, let us know and we'll be happy to call and, and explain that. But we're, again, as a quick, reminder, when we talk about mixing 10 ounces of Trimtec, as in this example, into a gallon of solution, we're going to mix 10 ounces of Trimtec with 118 ounces of water to come with a total 128 ounce solution. So that's why when we talk about the mixing procedure, going back here, we're going to fill our desired amount of water halfway. We're going to mix in our Trimtec. We're going to mix in our non surfactant. We're gonna make sure that we kind of shake it at this point. We're gonna triple rinse that measuring container into, the, um, into our reservoir here. And the reason for that is if you've used Trimtech before, you'll notice that again, it's a very thick, thick product. So it will adhere to the sides of your mixing container. So by triple rinsing out, one is you triple rinse out your container, which is always a good management practice, best management practice. But two is you make sure you're getting all that trim tech out of that mixing container into the reservoir. So we want to make sure that we're triple rinsing our container back in to our container here. Then we will top off the container. So then we'll fill the container to our total desired amount of solution. And then again, agitate. When you're using larger spray equipment, not much changes, but there are a few things to remember. When we're using larger spray equipment, one is you want to make sure you're keeping that solution agitated throughout the entire mixing process. So make sure you maintain agitation while you're mixing Trimtech the entire time. The other thing to keep in mind, this is another distinction, is that often with our larger spray equipment, you know, our hose is on a hose reel, and usually we're dealing with anywhere from 100 to 300 feet of hose. Um, that's on that hose reel. That 100 to 300 feet of hose, there is probably some kind of water. There's going to be a volume of some solution in that. So one is we need to account for how much solution is in that hose, and that can be anywhere from three to five gallons of solution in that hose, depending upon how long it is. And you can do this math pretty easy. Um, you can essentially just figure out what the interior diameter of that hose is and then figure out how long it is, 
And then you can just find an equation. Um, I would just Google uh, the volume of uh, a cylinder and put in your dimensions. So that would be the diameter of the interior of your hose and then the length of your hose. And that'll tell you the volume that's inside that hose. So you're gonna need to account for that when one, you're mixing. So if you have, in this case, you're a 20 gallon container and you have five gallons in your hose and you have to make sure you're mixing enough trim tech for 25 gallons. The next step of that, of course, is you need to make sure you cycle that solution through the hose. If you don't cycle your solution through the hose, then those first few plants you spray aren't getting trim tech. They're just gonna get water on them. And so they're gonna have normal growth. So make sure you cycle your hose, circulate it back through the tank to make sure that when you start spraying your shrubs, you're actually spraying trim tech and not whatever was in the hose last. So now that we've mixed up correctly, now it comes time for actual application. So again, trim tech is meant as a foliar application. There are some soil applied applications, but for the sake of our conversation today, we're going to focus on foliar applications. So trim tech needs to be applied as a spray to drip application. So we want to make sure we see water droplets, spray to drip, uh, full and even coverage on the plant. So it is only locally systemic. So you need to make sure that you want to spray every part of the plant thoroughly and evenly that you want to have uh, growth regulation achieved on. Trim tech is taken up best by the succulent stems. So in, not necessarily new growth, but the newest growth. And so really what it is is these green stems is where trim tech is taken up by. So when we talk about spraying to drip, what we're doing is we're talking about coating those stems and we'll talk more about that here in a moment. So as an example, one gallon of mixed solution of trim tech. So you've mixed your trim tech into your container and you're ready to spray. On average, one gallon of mixed trim tech should cover about 300 square feet of surface area. Now this is going to depend upon the size and the density of the plant. You know, if you're dealing with something like Iliagnus, which is a very dense plant, you might be using more trim tech per, per um, area of, of shrub versus something that is um, not as dense, um, depending upon how certain plants are grown, like Abelia or roses, they might not be as dense. So you might actually end up um, using less product per uh, area of plant. But in general, one gallon of ready to use trim tech is going to cover about 300 square feet of surface area. Now back to the application process here. So trim tech will be absorbed by the leaves, but it's really going to be better absorbed by that softer branch tissue, this new succulent tissue. Again, not necessarily new growth, but the newest growth. So imagine this is a shrub here, twig. And now, of course, this shrub would probably have leaves on it, but for the case of this, this does not have leaves on it so that we can see the actual stem. So when we spray trim tech, it's going to, we're going to spray to drip. It's going to drip off the leaves and it's going to drip down onto this succulent tissue, this green tissue. From there, it's going to be absorbed into that tissue and then it's going to be translocated up into those subapical meristems. And recall from very early on in our conversation here today that we are blocking the hormone that's responsible for cell elongation and, and expansion, gibberellins, and that is produced in those subapical meristems. So we want to make sure when we're applying that one, we have succulent growth, because um, without succulent growth, trim tech will not be absorbed. Trim tech is not absorbed into woody growth, just succulent growth. That doesn't necessarily mean the brand new growth. This could be growth from last year that we're treating this spring, but it needs to be green and have buds. So succulent growth, green growth that has intact buds, spray to drip, it gets absorbed into that stem, translocated into that submitter stem, and that's when we start seeing growth control. Just as an example, this is what spray to drip looks like. So we wanna make sure that we're really coating that plant and see here this on this lower pedalum, we have some some droplets here still on the leaves, and you can see how that's dropped down onto that succulent twig tissue. All right, so when to apply. To make a long story short, you can apply anytime the plant is actively growing. So that could be as early as bud swell when we start getting consistent temperatures in the high 60s, so mid to high 60s, so early on in the spring. 
if you start seeing in the weather forecast that you're going to start getting temperatures in the mid to high 60s consistently, you could go ahead and you can start spraying. In the early stages of growth, so when we have less than a half an inch, half less than an a half an inch of growth, sorry to get that out. Sorry about that. If we have less than an inch of growth, go ahead and start spraying. Another example here is we have just a little bit of growth. Go ahead and start spraying because again we have that nice green twig tissue that the product's going to be absorbed into. If you did a light pruning, now again this is a distinction, just a light pruning. If you just had to take some tips off, um, just to shape up the plant, a light pruning, low dose pruning, you can go ahead and treat. However, this is our big distinction. This is where we see a lot of breakdowns. If you prune heavily, if you prune back into woody stems, and this might be a bit extreme, but if you prune into any woody stem and you don't have that succulent new growth, you're not gonna get growth regulation. In the case of this plant here, if we sprayed this plant here today, these little areas of green would be growth regulated, but all these areas where the plant has been absorbed, has have been cut back to woody growth, Trimtech is not gonna be absorbed into that, Latent buds will express themselves and they will grow like normal. So you can spray Trimtech anytime the plant is actively growing. As long as you have green stem tissue intact, there is no need to prune before application. If the plant is the size, shape, and density that you want it to be at, and we have active growing, an actively growing plant, go ahead and treat. If you prune hard, if you prune back and you see a lot of woody tissue, and it doesn't have to be big woody tissue, but you have woody tissue and you don't have any succulent growth in that area, wait for it to flush back out. Here's an example of what growth control can look like. So in this case here, we have a plant that was recently maintained. It looks really nice. We have a lot of intact woody tissue. This is what it looks like. This is 17 days after treatment. So you can already see our treated versus our treated, or excuse me, our treated versus our untreated. You can see our untreated is already beginning to grow and our treated is starting to hold. That's a close up of what that treated looks like. So you can see a little bit of that residue. Uh, it's not too terrible. Now, application rates. We have an application guide. Um, and you will see on this application guide that we have a, um, usually a rate range for species. So again, this rate range um, is to kind of, depending upon the where that plant is growing in your region of the country, you may or may not need to use, um, you know, certain rates on that plant. So Obelia is a good example. If we have Obelia growing in full shade up in Pennsylvania, we might get away with using a lower rate. Versus if we have Obelia growing here in North Carolina in full sun and irrigation, we're going to want to use a higher rate. In general, for best results, we highly recommend that you use the higher rate range for your shrub species. But again, this gives you the opportunity to be flexible in your applications. Um, likewise, let's say you're on a site that has a lot of alpine current and maybe just one or two Obelias. You can see that the highest rate for alpine current is six and a half ounces per gallon. Six and a half ounces per gallon falls within that rate range for Abelia. So instead of just, instead of spraying all of your alpine current in 6.5 and then going back and remixing for Abelia, you can just spray everything on that property at that highest common rate range. Helps with your operational efficiency and you should see um, growth control across um, species. We have these supplemental application guides. Um, that you can that we can provide for you as well. So again, you can reach out to your local territory manager or arborologist for that. Um, again, going back to application, you need full and even coverage, spray to drip. This application will let you know how good of an applicator you are or how good your technician is at spraying because anything you don't touch with Trimtech is going to grow like normal. If you don't get even coverage, again, you're going to see really good growth regulation in some parts of the plant and not in other parts of the plant. Big question we always get is rain fastness. So as soon as the product has dried, as soon as Trimtech has dried on the plant, it will have absorbed as much of that active ingredient as possible. So as long as the application is dried before a rain event, you should be good to go as far as rain fastness. Generally speaking, we say within a half an hour to an hour after the application, you should be okay. 
um, if you have a rain event. So as long as the product is dried on the plant, you should still see growth control. Some of the reasons why your application might not work well. So again, if we have anything on the plant that will intercept trim tech, so paclobutrazole, the active ingredient, will get held up in organic material, such as leaves or clippings. So if there are leaves on the plant, you wanna make sure these are raked or blown off. If you had a pruning event and you didn't rake off or, or get that, those clippings off the plant, again, that will intercept trim tech. Um, and so that could be a problem that you might not get those results that you're looking for. Some of the other breakdowns we see, again, I mentioned this before, this isn't pruned back into large woody tissue, but we have pruned back into woody tissue here. So if we sprayed this plant today, where we see green would be regulated. But this area here, where we pruned back a little too hard, this would grow, grow like normal, and you would see normal growth here. So again, if you prune hard, you have to wait for the plant to flush back out. And I will reiterate that as long as the plant is the size, shape, and density you want it to be, there's no need to prune at all. If you like the way the plant looks and it's actively growing, go ahead and spray. No need for any pruning event. This is another example here. So we can see here we have nice regulated growth on this plant and we have some escapes. If we trace those escapes back, those escapes come back to a large pruning wound. So again, at the time of application, this was exposed woody tissue. There was no buds here to spray. When they sprayed over the top, they regulated everything here. But right here, they had an escape because they pruned back to woody tissue and did not flush back out yet. Here's the other breakdown that we see is that if the plant has already flushed out significantly, so in this case here, what we're looking at is this plant, this side was treated, this side was untreated, and it looks, it, it looks like it's still growing. And it's because we just treated too late. So on the day of treatment, you can see here that we already have probably three inches at least of growth on our treated versus our untreated side. So if you wait too late to treat, it doesn't shrink the plant. So this is a growth regulator. It stops the plant from growing as large, but does not shrink it. So if it's already flushed out fully, you wanna make sure that um, you might need a pruning event before you treat, you might need to wait. This is just an example of that plant again. So you can see we still achieved growth control, but it grew out in that time frame because it was already, in a sense, that tipid elongation had already taken place. So we waited too late to treat. So again, make sure that the plant is the size, shape, and density that you desire prior to treatment. Uh, don't wait too long because plants will grow. And if uh, you wait too long to treat, then the, the plant will have grown. Um, here's some more examples too of breakdowns of treatments. In this case here, the technician didn't want to get any trim tech on the windows. So you can see where we achieved good growth regulation and where the plant continued to grow. So full coverage is key. Here again, this is a dense plant. This is Iliagnus. Um, so if you traced these runners back, you would find that they came from well inside the plant. Some of these came all the way from the root system, in fact. Um, but again, a good example of imagine this entire plant growing uh, this over the entire canopy instead of just the runners that are coming up from the interior. So instead of using three, three people and power shears, they use just one person, some hand snips, and just a bucket to put those things in. Another thing to think about is the more you use it, the better it works. So after repeated applications, you will see that you get better growth control. Uh, so this is an example here. This is, um, this is six weeks after treatment. Uh, this is going into the third year of treatment. And so this is Manhattan Euonymus, which would usually spray at a very high rate. This was sprayed with um, one third to half the rate. And we're getting the same growth control expectations here. So the more often you use TrimTech, if you use it in, um, again, with a protocol of one treatment, um, every 12 weeks, uh, at least two treatments a season, you'll see really great results. Um, another thing that we have seen as far as a treatment breakdown is simply just using a tank that had herbicide in it before. Um, this was a call that we got from one of our clients. Uh, they were certain that Trimtech was uh, causing phytotoxicity, but lo and behold, we found out that prior to mixing Trimtech, they had mixed SureGuard 
uh, into that. SureGuard is a phenomenal herbicide. Um, SureGuard does not come out of tanks even after you triple rinse them. Uh, it doesn't come out of tanks even after you use a, a, a buffering agent or a, a tank cleaning agent. So we highly recommend the use of a dedicated tank for uh, Trimtech. So in conclusion, um, again, using Trimtech can be safer for your crews. You know, this is what we see in parts of the country. Uh, but if you know me, you know I say don't hate, growth regulate. Uh, in conclusion, so what does Trimtech mean for our plants? We'll have a greener plant that's more resistant to diseases, more drought resistant, reduces our top growth by 30 to 70 percent, uh, increase our labor savings, increase our safety, reduce waste, waste and reduce complaints. Um, we do have an application video, a short application video. It's about six minutes. You can find that on our um, website at the Trimtech link. Uh, we also have our plant growth regulator guide that covers over the science of plant growth regulators, uh, how they can be used in the landscape, and uh, give you a good idea of what your expectations could be. Um, you can always, of course, reach out to your local territory manager uh, or arborologist. Again, our technical support information, if you have any questions, uh, whether it be diagnostics, questions about products, uh, questions about equipment or troubleshooting, uh, or simply ordering new products, um, you can reach out to us at any time at our tech support line. Uh, again, you can call us on the phone. You can send us a text message, email us. Uh, we also have a live chat on our website as well. And with that, thank you all so much for your time uh, this afternoon slash this morning. Really appreciate your attendance and attention. And uh, we'll ask Matt now if we have any questions, and I'll be happy to answer any questions in the next 10 or so minutes that we have. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Uh, we did have quite a few questions come in, so I will read them off as they came in. So first off, uh, can we ever over apply? That's a great question. So yes, you absolutely can over apply. Um, so that's again, you want to make sure that you're following um, the label and the uh, Trimtech uh, guide, application guide. Um, now I will say that with uh, compared to other plant growth regulators. Um, it's it's harder to it's not as easy to get over regulation with TrimTech as it is for other plant growth regulators. Um, so over regulation comes in the form of small leaves and the appearance of witches blooming because again you're reducing um, that internodal growth. So in a sense, you have all of your leaves coming from like one internode um, as opposed to spread out over several internodes. So it, over regulation comes in the form of a funny looking appearance. Um, we have not had any plants uh, that have died because of application of Trimtech. We do have a few plants that are very, very sensitive to Trimtech. Um, one would be um, copper leaf. And I apologize, I forget the actual genus for that, but copper leaf is grown in subtropical parts of the country. We see it a lot in uh, Southern California and Florida. So that plant is very, very sensitive to the point where we don't recommend people apply Trimtech to that plant. Um, the other issues we have is with uh, Ruella, also call it Mexican Petunia. Um, it makes the leaves turn. Um, there's so much chlorophyll produced that the leaves look black. That already has kind of like a purplish leaf to it already. So it doesn't kill a plant. Uh, it doesn't really hurt the plant. It just makes the plant look bad. Uh, it looks like it has black leaves. Um, which might be an ornamental thing for some people, but we don't recommend people apply to that plant. And then finally, ground cover peanut, which is again, I've only ever encountered it in Florida. Uh, it will turn that yellow. So those are the exceptions uh, to plants that we would uh, avoid spraying. Uh, but for the most part, uh, we should see really good uh, growth regulation and those secondary health benefits associated with growth regulation on um, most of the species when applied at the correct rates. All right, so next question is, why not use systemic application, i.e. a drench? Oh, great question. So why not use a drench? So if you're familiar with plant growth regulators and some of our products, and you might have even seen this in this presentation where we referenced Canvastat a few times. Um, so Canvastat is a sister product to Trimtech. It is a soil applied um, tree growth regulator. Um, so the question, of course, leads us to why not do a soil application? Because again, if you're familiar with plant growth regulators, you know that soil applications usually last a little bit longer than 12 to, to 16 weeks, like we say the Trimtech's gonna last. 
Um, the problem comes uh, from two things. One is with smaller canopy plants. So a smaller canopy plant like, um, like a, a shrub, your typical shrub that is maybe maintained anywhere from you know, six to two feet from the ground. When you're dealing with the smaller canopy, you have a greater chance of over-regulating the plant, which I just described that over-regulation would look like, you know, that really small looking leaf um, and super short internodes. So you have this kind of witch's brooming effect. So it's not a good look. So with smaller canopy plants like shrubs, um, you have a higher likelihood of over-regulating the plant. Um, so again, if you're doing one plant at a time um, and you're being very careful with it, it's possible. But practically speaking, on you know most commercial landscapes, even you know our homeowner landscape, to do that to shrubs, um, again, you have a high likelihood of overregulation, so it's not recommended. Um, the next part of that, though, is um, almost the opposite: is uh, expectations around plant growth regulation. And this comes down to if you're dealing with a hedge scenario. So let's say you have a hedge scenario where you know you have a solid hedge that's you know anywhere from you know 10 to 100 feet long and it's made up of several individual plants. Well those individual plants have overlapping root systems. Uh, they have different size canopies because of pruning and spacing and things like that. So when you try to apply to the soil of a hedge scenario what you often run into is inconsistent growth regulation. So it shows up in the form of plants that aren't regulated at all, plants that are regulated, and then plants that are overregulated. And you can have all of those in one hedge um, based upon the fact that, you know, each plant, when you're dosing a plant from a soil standpoint, you're really you're dosing the canopy um, and different size canopies and overlapping root systems. Again, you're not getting consistent uptake in the plant. Um, so that's one reason. The other reason in the hedge scenario is all of these plant growth regulators, um, the active ingredients can be held up by organic material like fallen leaves and debris. So in a hedge scenario, you need to make sure that you're clearing out all of those fallen leaves and debris before you make that application. Um, and that's just difficult to do. So a lot of your plant growth regulator gets held up in that um, organic layer that's underneath the shrub in a hedge type scenario. And that's the reason why we developed trim tech because, you know, ideally we would have used canvas stat on shrubs and we would have been good to go. Um, but we just, we could not get that, um, that consistent result. Um, and so that's where the idea for trim tech was born and, and why it is uh, around today. All right. Next question is, can crab apples be foliar sprayed for fire blight instead of fungicides or phosphorus apps? It's a great question. So yes, the answer is yes. The, um, you can spray um, crab apples, pears, um, any of these plants that are susceptible to fire, but you can spray them with Trimtech um, as an alternative to copper sprays or um, or phosphorus sprays. Again, you can um, or phosphite sprays rather. Um, you can um, you could use it independently. So you could use just Trimtech. Uh, you could also use it in combination with those things as well. And a lot of times with plant growth regulators, if you're looking at it for a secondary health benefit, um, you know, I, I often tell folks to think of it as like a synergist. So it'll kind of help with um, whatever, whatever whatever other treatments you are doing for that plant. Um, but again, it can be used, as we saw in the data, um, it can be used independently as a treatment for fire blight. Again, the caveat to that is timing. So you need to spray before you're getting that new flush of growth. Uh, the way it's working is it's simply it's regulating plant growth. So it is making it so there's just not as much green tissue for that fire blight to affect. Uh, so timing would be key with fire blight, but it can be used independently in, and in combination with um, more traditional applications. And next question we got is, uh, what are your thoughts on mixing this with products such as herbicides, fungicides, or iron-based nutrients? Great question. So, uh, so I won't mix it with a herbicide. <laughs> now, that being said, if you um, there are mixing applications for herbicides, and in, in that application is that you want to kill the plant, right? Um, so, I would not mix with a herbicide on commercial landscape for growth control. Uh, I know there are some folks out there that may have said they've used Roundup uh, as a way to control things like Heliagnus, which I wouldn't recommend at all. Uh, so, I wouldn't use it with a herbicide. 
Um, as far as with other products, we definitely have plants that are mixing it specifically with insecticides um, so that you're getting, you know, your first round of insecticide treatment um, as well as, you know, getting growth control. So that would be a potential there. Um, so there would be no need to mix it with a fungicide. It is in the same chemical family as um, the triazoles. So other fungicides, propiconazole, microbutanol. And while it is not, and while Trimtech is not a fungicide uh, and we're not marketing it as a fungicide, nor will we ever market it as a fungicide, it has that type of, it can have that activity. So mixing it with a fungicide at the time of application um, could actually have some negative consequences um, as far as uh, a lot of those triazoles are also um, at high rates can be growth regulators as well. And if you look on the label of some of those triazoles, it actually says mixed at high rates on sensitive plants, you might see growth regulation. So I wouldn't mix it with a fungicide. Uh, and then the last question, iron. Uh, I do know of some clients that are mixing it with foliar nutrients as well and seeing great results. So uh, while I've never experienced it myself using uh, foliar nutrient, I've talked to a few folks that have used them and uh, have been very happy with that application as well. All right, I think a clarification question. Uh, so it's better not to prune before you apply Trimtect? That is correct. So the pruning question, this is, um, this is one that, yeah, we wanna make sure we cover over on. There is no need to prune before application. So as long as the plant is the size, shape, and density you want it to be in, go ahead and treat. We don't need to time around any type of pruning applications, uh, which is a distinction with other fully applied plant growth regulators. Um, again, if the plant needs to get pruned and it needs to get pruned hard, prune it, wait for it to flush back out, however long that's going to take, a week, two weeks, four weeks, whatever. Um, distinction again is it needs to get, Trimtech is absorbed into that um, green tissue. So that succulent tissue, the newest tissue. So you essentially you need green tissue, you need a bud. I always tell people, um, you know, if you have a leaf and a bud and something green there, go ahead and treat. But again, if you cut into any of that woody tissue, none of that woody tissue area is gonna be regulated. You're gonna have normal growth in that area. So no need to prune before application. Um, the size, the plant's the size, shape, and density, you like it, go ahead and treat, as long as it's actively growing as well. All right, so we're getting pretty close on time. If any of you wanna keep staying on, we'll go through as many of these questions as we can. Uh, next one is how far into flowering for perennials or shrubbery is the best time to spray? Um, so as far as flowering on perennials, um, so you'd want to spray on a perennial before, well, again, right when it's about the size that you want it to be, the plant itself, you would want to go ahead and, and treat. Um, my uh, uh, counterpart uh, up in the mid-Atlantic Northeast has done a lot of work on the perennials um, and his treatments always kind of coincide with just before those new flowers are being formed and he seems to have really great results with that. Um, as far as shrubs, again, um, you know, as long as the plant's a size, shape, and density, um, you know, spraying it during flowering is not going to hurt anything. This is not an insecticide. We should have no negative consequences to pollinators. Um, if you spray them and they're on the plant, they're going to be unhappy. So, you know, you might want to wait to spray, you know, in the early mornings in those cases, but um, we shouldn't have any issues there. Um, it will take, so with these secondary health benefits, again, it's going to take some time to see the results. So it's not like if you, um, you know, you spray today, all of a sudden next week, you're going to have a better flower display than your neighbors. Um, but again, uh, you will see over time, improve flower to spray, whether that be from the plant reallocating energy to the flowers, or just simply you're not pruning as often um, and you have more flowers physically on the plant because they're not being removed. All right, uh, let's see. Next one is using the nine and a half ounce per gallon rate on boxwoods. I tend to get a lot of white resi residue that stays around for weeks that is unacceptable for my clients. Any suggestions? So the good news is that our newer formulations, so we just, um, we have a new formulation out there. Um, it's still same expectations as far as growth control. Um, there's nothing that's changed on the label. In fact, you know, it's, um, you know, it's in the same bottle, but our, our new formulation has less residue. Um, so you should see with Trimtech that you receive this spring, 
you should notice um, significantly reduced residue. You'll still have some, um, but it's going to be nowhere near the way it was. Um, and I will, I can, I just did some treatments with that not long ago. I can get some pictures if Matt, if you want to take that um, person's information, I can make sure we get some maybe um, pictures over to him of what what the old formulation and new formulation residue looks like. Not a problem. Uh, one follow-up question on large shrubs by Vernon and Hollies. How do you decide when to use Trimtech versus Canvastat? Oh, great question. So if you're dealing with tree form Hollies, um, so if you have a, um, say you have a, a tree form Holly that's growing by itself, tree form, again, it's anywhere from, let's say, you know, six feet or taller. Um, and you can get to the base of that plant with no problems, uh, even if you have to kind of dig through those lower branches, but you basically to the base, base of that plant, I would use Trimtech on those tree form hollies. Um, and the reason why I would use Trimtech, or excuse me, I meant to say Cambostat, I would use Cambostat on those tree form hollies. Uh, and the reason why I'd use Cambostat is again, you just, you're gonna get longer growth regulation on those hollies if you use Cambostat as a soil application. So Trimtech as a fuller application, you're gonna get about 12 weeks of growth control. Canvas that as a soil application, you're going to get two to three seasons of growth control. So you're getting longer growth control uh, for that application. Um, so for tree form hollies, I would I would always defer to canvas that. Now that being said, if you can't apply canvas that for whatever reason, or let's say you know this is a commercial property and maybe it's up for bid next year, and you're not sure you're going to get it. Um, I wouldn't apply canvas that to a property where I don't think I'm going to be on it in the next two or three years. Cause in a sense you will have paid for, um, you know, the growth control and all the benefits of growth control, uh, for your competitor to come on and uh, take advantage of. Uh, but again, all things aside, if I had a tree form Holly, I would use canvas that if I could get to the base of it with no problems. Um, and just for the fact that you would get longer growth control. Um, but you still could use trim tech if, if you wanted to. All right, next question. Uh, can you use Trimtech to supplement a Canvastat application? Uh, for example, a season or two after initial Canvastat application. I'm sorry, you broke up just for a second, Matt. Could you repeat that question? Yeah, not a problem. So can you use Trimtech to supplement a Canvastat application? For example, a season or two after an initial Canvastat application? Um, so you could. So the, it's a good question. Um, so let's say for whatever reason you're two years out and you're starting to see, you expect your your plant to break regulation with Canvastat, and for whatever reason you don't want to apply Canvastat again, um, you absolutely you could spray Trimtech uh, and get that 12 week growth control, um, and then you know sometime in that time apply Canvastat um, and then get extended growth control. Um, we often see, I would say there's been scenarios where we see the opposite of that, where folks will apply Trimtech because Trimtech, when you apply Trimtech, it gets absorbed into the plant that day and it gets absorbed into the, the area of the plant that's blocking that hormone. So with Trimtech, you're gonna, in a sense, you're gonna start getting that reaction um, very quickly. Whereas with Canvastat, it's gonna take time for it to move up into the plant and start that growth regulation process. So what some folks will do, uh, and again, going back to this tree form holly example, some folks will spray Trimtech um, to get fast growth control and then follow it up with a canvas that application. Because on a, a tree form, your average tree form holly, we're gonna expect to see growth control within three to six months of application. Um, so if you start first thing in the spring, spray Trimtech, that's gonna give you about 12 weeks of growth control in that time, Canvastat will be making its way up through the tree. It's going to be starting to kind of take over, blocking that gibberellin as Trimtech is beginning to wear off. Um, and in a sense, if it's timed right, you'll get this kind of like seamless growth control. So as the Trimtech's wearing off, Canvastat's being absorbed into the plant, it's taking over growth control, and then you get that two to three seasons of growth control. All right, we got two more questions. See if we can squeeze them in here. Um, then we'll get you guys on your way for the rest of the day. 
Um, so sometimes there's carryover as well as with nine bark I've witnessed, meaning control may go into the next growing season. Can you speak to this as well? Yeah, it's a great question. So especially in um, so parts of the country where the growing season isn't as long, you will you can definitely see carryover with um, with trim tech, especially on the sensitive species like nine bark. So nine bark is uh, one of the species that's sensitive to paclobutrazole, as in um, you know, it works very well in nine bark. Um, so, you know, if you're spraying, if you're in a part of the country where, you know, spring doesn't really start until May or June and fall begins around September or October, um, you can definitely see carryover into the next year. Uh, and in northern parts of the country, and you know, things like nine bark uh, and things like uh, corn species, you know, we might see two seasons of growth control um, with trim tech. Um, now that is, you know, very much, uh, I would say the exception and the rule and versus other parts of the country, uh, you know, in other parts of the country, we need to apply trim tech at least twice a year, um, to maintain control for a full season. But again, here in North Carolina, uh, you know, our spring started about three, four weeks ago and it will go all the way through, um, you know, November. So, <laughs> but yeah, so in parts of the country, Sensitivity of plant, region of the country will dictate your um, your intervals of, of trim protect and how long you'll see growth regulation for sure. All right, and last question. What is the difference in using trim tech as opposed to using a type one PGR like Atromec? So the biggest thing is, um, the biggest advantage is when it comes down to what those, um, the length of growth control and the secondary health benefits. So Atromec um, is a type one plant growth regulator. The way its mode of action is it blocks cell division. Um, so it is, it's a true plant growth regulator. It stops the plant from growing. Um, now, as a side effect of that, in some species, some species it doesn't really work well in, at all, and other species can be hypersensitive. So in some species, you can see um, the plant will turn yellow for a couple weeks after application. Um, some of the leaves might fall off after application. Um, and then uh, likewise, you might get some like the new growth might be distorted and not look good. So you could have like dwarf leaves. Um, you can have uh, like stems that are um, you know, epinasty in the stems. You can have uh, issues there. The plant just doesn't look great after application. Uh, and the other thing is that application, the growth control is usually about uh, eight weeks, a little bit in that time frame, eight, eight, ten weeks. Um, versus trim tech, which of course is a type two plant growth regulator. So it's not blocking cell division, it's just blocking the production of that hormone that's responsible for cell elongation and expansion. So we're not stopping the plant from growing, we're just not asking it to get as large. Um, and then with the type two plant growth regulators, they are associated with what we consider those secondary health benefits. So that's where we see with type two plant growth regulators like trim tech and canvas stat, we see darker greener leaves, we see disease resistance, and we see drought resistance. So the difference between Trimtech and Atromec just comes down to that mode of action. So again, Atromec's a type one plant growth regulator, block cell division. Um, Trimtech is a type two plant growth regulator, just stops that hormone from being produced. And then the other part I forgot to mention too, is this comes to an operational thing. Atromec is like a two-step process. So with Atromec, you need to prune. So before an application, you need to prune and you need to be close to that pruning event with application within at least a week or two weeks of a pruning event, you have to apply. Again, because of that mode of action, it stops cell division. So you need to cut the plant and then spray it so it doesn't grow. Um, so it's a two-step process. You always have to prune before application. Key distinction with TrimTech is again, you don't need to prune before application. As long as that plant is the size, shape, and density you like it to be, go ahead and spray. There's no need to work around pruning events. So you have better looking plant, longer growth control. Um, you don't have to, operationally, you don't have to work around a pruning event. Um, and yeah, there's a, there's a difference between Atromec and, and TrimTech. <laughs> All right, perfect. And that is all the questions we have. Thank you, everyone, for being patient and hanging out with us a little bit after. I know we went a little bit over, but uh, hope that information was beneficial for you all. 
And again, thank you everybody today. Please reach out to uh, Rainbow, your territory manager, local arborologist. Um, we're more than happy to, to work with you on this and many other protocols. So thank you all. Have a great rest of your day and week.